Um, Anti-Semitism. And we're going to tie it in the bit of Hanukkah. So, Rabbi Grumblatt gave a very interesting scenario, and it's an incident, it's an incident, uh, the son, Akiva, Rabbi Akiva Grumblatt, gave a very interesting uh, uh, scenario, an incident, uh, and I think in some ways we've all experienced this incident, whether it be through ourselves, or seeing other people go through the same, something similar. And uh, I think it's a very interesting uh, scenario. Um, it's about like a bystander, I mean a guy. Actually, just picture this. An F train pulls up to, to the station. Let's say 47th Street. And the doors open up. Everybody gets on. And there's this old man. <clears throat> hears the train coming from upstairs. I don't know how he hears. I guess through his hearing aid. He hears the train coming. So he starts running down the stairs to catch the train. He's running down the stairs, and um, you know the way the old men run, you know, or whatever. And he reaches the bottom of the stairs. He picks up his umbrella, uh, and he yells out, "Wait, wait, wait!" Right? And the doors close as he tries to get closer. I mean, he's not even near close, right? Uh, but by the time he gets anywhere near the doors of the train, that's already pulls out. So what does the old man do? He's huffing and puffing uh, from the tremendous effort that he, that he, uh, that he uh, whatever, experiences, and he regains his composure. Only we find him now, right? We find him now red-faced and angry. And he picks up his umbrella and he says in an angry gesture and screams out, anti-Semite! To the conductor, you know, it was like you know, halfway you know, in the tunnel already. So, uh, hearing this or watching this, we know that the old man uses that terminology a little bit too loosely, too generous, generously, right? There's no anti-Semitism anti in that in in this story, but this old man. Deranged? No. But what triggered off this comment by the old man? Anti-Semite. What triggered it off? There is no anti-Semite here. There's no anti-Semitism in this case. But yet, this old man screamed it out. You know, but you know what they say, you know, when there's smoke, there's fire. Obviously, there must have been some experience in this old man's life or an attitude from his culture, right? From his culture that warrants him to react in such a manner. If you look around the European Jewry, and, I'm, and some of us are old enough to uh, have friends uh, whose parents experience the Holocaust, such as atrocities, um, there's this guarded attitude among people our age right, who were in their late 40s, uh, towards the non-Jews. But you feel at any given moment, any wrong statement from the Goyim will trigger, ah, he must have been an anti-Semite, he's an anti-Semite. He's an anti-Semite. Now let's not single out just Ashkenazim and European Jewry uh, for being too jumpy when it comes to uh, you know, anti-Semitic uh, reaction. The Sephardim are on the edge as well. And um, I have a personal story. My grandfather was a victim of anti-Semitism in Russia. When he was spotted on the train, he had a beard, definitely looked like a Jew. So he had a beard and all. And uh, he was coming or going from a business trip and the Bolsheviks, hatred towards Jews, triggered them to throw him off the train. They threw him off a running train. And he was paralyzed, half his body was paralyzed. This hatred had a rippled effect on the entire, our entire family, obviously. Right? Half his body was paralyzed. It changed the plan for our family. My father... Uh, his brother 
my aunt and my grandparents were uh, planning on moving to, uh, to Israel. This is back in the, uh, in the 20s, in the early 20s. And they were delayed. Uh, and my grandfather and aunt had changed the plans and they stayed in Israel. I'm sorry, in Russia. And my grandparents were determined that their children, their sons actually, be raised in Israel. At any cost, at any circumstances, they wanted their two boys, my father and uncle, to be there. Now, but without the patriarch, the patriarch around, without the, the father figure around, it was definitely hard for my father, my grandmother, and my uncle. Being behind the Iron Curtain, there was no communication. The loneliness without his wife and boys was tremendous. The absence of a father uh, was definitely needed by you know, my, fa my father and his sons. Definitely needed. It's a direct result of what? Anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism. We felt it. Personally. Per it would have changed the entire scope of our family. Who knows what we have, what we have been or whatever. So Jewish people as a whole, whether it be Sephardic or Ashkenaz, experienced anti-Semitism. I'm sure the Persians have, have experienced themselves in the late 70s in Iran with the Shah and the uh, Khomeini. We personally know a person's grandfather who got killed, uh, one of the people who got killed initially, hung on television. We actually saw it. His face was covered, but we knew it was our friend's grandfather. So, whether it be the uh, Crusades, uh, the pogroms, the Bolsheviks, the Spanish Inquisition, Khomeini, Hitler, uh, and the, uh, of course, we all know the, it, it's universal, the accusations of the, uh, of the Gentiles, for example, that we kidnapped their children, and they, we drink their blood. So, you know, these are the uh, kind of accusations that not just the Sephardim or the Ashkenazim, both, every one of us experienced this in our ancestor, you know, whether it be in our grandparents' country. You know, I'm surprised that my wife knows about it from Bukhara or, or Tzimakan, Tashken, and uh, the European countries for sure, you know, they've always told stories that uh, they, they were crucified crucify with these stories um, and uh, you experience that in all parts of the world as Jews uh, now it was safe to say or at least I thought right that until the incident in Brooklyn a few weeks ago a month ago uh, and, and it was kind of sad because this is in the heart of the Jewish area in Brooklyn. This was it Flappish or Midwood. I'm not sure where it was. Very populated Jewish neighborhood. We used to live in Brooklyn. So I kind of you know, used to pass by there. And, and uh, this is in the heart of Brooklyn. The heartland. The Avenue J and what? Avenue J and Ocean Parkway. And Ocean Parkway. This, you know, this, is, this is where we used to live a block away. So, and I thought it sort of got a little bit better I remember, you know, um, in the 60s and 70s, you kind of felt it. You felt the prejudice against the Jews, the anti-Semitism. I remember going trick-or-treating. Yes, I went trick-or-treating as a kid because I guess the Irish influence, the Irish Rico Park neighborhood, we had a certain influence on, on us as Jews. And I went trick-or-treating. Now, I remember on one incident, there was a group of us you know, I was the only Jew in the group. Uh, and, the, and the lady comes out, oh, what a, you know, nice children you are. And look at these beautiful, the, these scary costumes that you guys are wearing. I didn't wear a costume. I guess I was scary without it, right? But um, out of nowhere, no, mind you, I was wearing a baseball cap. I never wore my kippah in a neighborhood. It's an Irish neighborhood. I never wore my kippah. I always wear a baseball cap, so this person did not know I was Jewish. And she said, out of nowhere, uh, I was part of this group, uh, and she said, 
I just like that. She just said it. Uh, as long as you kids are not Jewish, I'm happy. Couldn't believe that. Just like that. Here's a, here's a kid who is Jewish, hearing this among his non-Jewish friends. I was shocked. Did you take the candy? And listen to this. And that was the last house that I went trick-or-treating at. And uh, not only that, I, I actually returned the candy to, to the... To the to, I just gave it away. I didn't even want to look at the candy anymore. Just, I just felt... I wasn't hurt, but I was shocked. It was like a shocking, stinging experience of anti-Semitism. Shocking experience. Um, now, anti-Semitism is there. It's real. What triggers it? And what fuels it? That's what we're going to explore today about anti-Semitism. What kind of anti-Semitism was during Hanukkah time? What kind of anti-Semitism was there? Is it different than the one in Purim time? I think there is a difference. But more questions to ponder. Today, today's day and age in America, a country that is not considered religious, even more so in Europe, which I think is less religious than America. America has this like Puritan uh, feel to it today. Uh, Anti-Semitism is still practiced in America. People have that feeling of anti against Jews, which is shocking. Um, because we're not, it's not a religious country. Usually in a religious country is where you feel prejudice against the Jews. Usually, right? Um, but in this country that's not religious, we're surprised that there is anti-Semitism. Because uh, if it was religious, forget about it. Forget about it. But even today, why is it still around? So let's examine this a bit. Let's first look at the um, inception of the Jewish people, all right? Jews were in Mitzrayim, in Egypt, and funny, were they worthy to leave Egypt? Were they worthy to leave Mitzrayim? They were idol worshippers, and in fact, there's a famous Midrash, uh, the sages say, explain that Micha, one, there's one guy there, Micha, Jewish guy, who um, was carrying his idols as he was crossing the sea. You know, the sea split. He saw these beautiful, amazing miracles that God just did, and this guy is carrying his idols across the sea. How insulting it is to God. But there was definitely idol worship among the Jews. Mind-boggling. So why did the Jews get the green light to leave? They were idol worshippers. What was the reason why they left Egypt? What's the reason? Now, one should take note that when Yosef, who was a viceroy to Paro, the second in command, uh, and the brothers came to see him, you know, they wanted food. You know, they came, you know, from hunger. It was a hunger all over the world, uh, world that they knew then. And they came to Egypt, because that's where the food was. Uh, and uh, they haven't seen his, you know, their long-lost brother. And uh, they sat together for a meal. They sat together for a meal to eat. And it says specifically that they were separate from the Egyptians. The Egyptians sat separate. And the brothers and the Jews, the Jews sat sat separate. Like segregation. Segregation. In America, they were segregated. Yo, when Yosef was about to reveal to his brothers, hey, I'm your brother Yosef, right? What did he do? Just if you would pay attention to what he did, very interesting. Uh, he told the Egyptians to step out of the room. To step out of the room. We learn from our ancestors, from Yosef, that the main reason we learn or uh, notice that you know what I didn't say uh, uh, I didn't say read, but what we learn every year when we go over the parsha 
we have to learn something, some new thing. You know, you've been hearing it every year, every year, for years and years and years. And it's very important that we learn a, a valuable lesson from each time we learn the Torah. What do we learn here about Yosef? What do we learn from the story of Yosef? We learn over here that Yosef, because of the privacy of his brothers, he didn't want them that reaction, that first reaction, that embarrassing reaction that the Egyptians would, would see what goes on between them. At the most vulnerable state of the brothers, and it was vulnerable, they were shocked. I am Yosef, and they were like, what? Right? In that shocking moment, he didn't want the Egyptians to see them at their vulnerable state. They didn't want them to see them at their vulnerable state. And um, so it's very important to see, to understand that Yosef, you know, tried to protect his brothers. And this is how you have to treat, first of all, privacy is very important. And this is what, you know, the, the goyim, you don't eat with them. That's what we learned from Yosef and his brothers. And um, uh, you see, eating is very important. Eating is a form of closeness. You know, I think that one thing we, uh, we have over here is besides eating the pizza, there's a certain closeness that, that we, uh, you know, we develop. It's very important. There's a, <laughs> there's a Russian expression, right? that um, and you always have to be on guard. You cannot be on guard when you eat. When you're eating, you're, you let go a little bit. You can't you know, be on guard. You know, when you're walking the street, you're always on guard. You always have to, you know, <laughs> especially walking in the streets in New York, you're always on guard. But when you're eating, it's different. There's a Russian expression that my wife always says, I never pay attention, but when she says it, I, it, 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 you know, you, it, I quote it a few times, she says that when someone eats, not even a snake is allowed to bother you. What's that? You know the expression? Something like that. Not even a snake is allowed to bother you. Because when you're eating, no one should bother you. No one should come behind you and hug you and kiss you or whatever. No. No. Whenever, when you're eating, you know, no one should bother you. Because eating is at a vulnerable state. Eating and drinking, especially alcohol, can't do it. In, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's, so you have to be with the right frame, right frame of mind with the right people, right? So Yosef is hinting something out to us, right? That the Jews were separate in the Goyim. No eating with them is the lesson from Yosef, our ancestors. And furthermore, at the vulnerable state of disclosure, of revealing that I'm Yosef, your brother, Yosef didn't want the Egyptians to see them at a surprising state. Yosef knew the material who he was dealing with. He knew the Egyptians. That who knew, he knew the people he was dealing with. There was a clear separation, separation between them. And another important note, which I think is important on a different area, in the whole idea with Sarah, you know, how come it says, you know, in an in incident with Sarah, Achotihi, Achoti, she's my sister. When they came down to Egypt and to uh, Eretz Pelishtim, you know, uh, uh, Avram uh, had a beautiful wife, Sarah, and he said, listen, you know, I'm sure they're going to look at you, they're going to want you, and if they know that I'm your brother, they're going to kill me and get to you and, and steal you. Because they know that I'm going to, you know, they're going to take you, they're going to start up with you, and I'm going to show resistance. So you're going to get rid of me right away. So tell them that you're my brother. Tell them that you're my brother. So it, ha it, it says the incident three times. Twice with, with, uh, with uh, once with Paro, and once with uh, Avimelech, Eretz Pelishtim. And then a few parashiot later, Yitzchak, had the same problem with uh, going down to Avi Melech also. Why does it say it, why does it have to repeat it three times? The same incident, achoti, achoti, achoti. And the reason why is you cannot trust the Goyim. Avi Melech came from a very, how do I say it in Bukhari, Odam Shovan, that place. In the intelligentsia, these guys were with the beautiful suits, they were with the sharp tongue, tongues, educated, and it says, even 
Even so, you have to be afraid of the Goyim. You can't trust the Goyim. They'll still start up with you and your wife. They'll try to kill you behind the back. Right? This is what you learn from the incident with Avram, Sarah, and when it says, you know, Achotihi. You can't trust them. And that's why when Yaakov asked God, you know, when he was about to go down to Egypt to see Yosef, and they were planning on living there for you know, a short period of time, you know, surprise, surprise. It said, he, God, he, said, to, uh, he said to God, you, know, you sure you want me to, to go down there and live in, uh, in Egypt? So God said, because he was afraid of intermarriage. You know, my kids are going to be going there, they're going to, they might intermarry, they might find a nice Egyptian girl, right? So, God said, there's more of a problem where you are here in Canaan, because the people here, they might look kosher, but they're really not. They might look like very uh, up, up, upper class citizens, upstanding citizens, but you have to be careful with them. They might talk very nicely, they might look pretty, you know, they might dress nice, they might be educated, but still, don't be fooled with them. They're, they're not good, they're goyim. With, with the whole idea with the Egyptians, you know that they were not good quality. You know that they were barbaric. You know they were lowlifes. So you know you're going to be separated from them automatically. You wouldn't want to get near them. So that's a cardinal rule. Whenever Jews go to a strange country, and the country, and they look down at the Goyim, obviously, you don't, there's, there's a lot less intermarriage. When the Jews went into Persia, there was no, there's very, very little intermarriage. The Uzbeks, there's very, very little inter intermarriage. In those countries, that's not a problem. But if you go to Germany, and if you go to America, or other countries in Europe, where you, the Jews look up to the non-Jews, there's going to be more intermarriage. That's the problem. Uh, and that was the problem with Avimelech, the Canaan. That was more of an intellectual society. And then when, when that happens, watch out. That's dangerous. The Jews in Greek, they looked up to the Greeks. The Jews looked up to the Greece, Greeks. Like we said earlier, when the Jews look up to the Goyim as a culture, they start copying them, adapting their language. You know, they made their culture and language kosher. Uh, they penetrated into the Jewish lifestyle and life. Sounds familiar? Are you Greek first or Jews se and Jews second? That was the question. Are you American first or Jew second? <clears throat> Let me tell you something. Some of the people that are listening to this are, are immigrants. There's a certain protection that immigrants have. But as, peop as your children, you have to be very careful. Because as Americans, the kids are Americans. And they're going to constantly be in their, in their mind being pulled in each direction. Are you American first or are you Jewish first? Which is the answer? You don't have that question. Your kids will. Your kids will. So, once you let the genie out of the bottle, it's hard to get it back in. Once you, you know, are open to the society, it's very hard to close it again. Very important lesson. Right? <clears throat> There's going to be, they're going to become more Greeks than the Greeks. The Jews are going to be more Americans than the Americans to that extent. And that's what you have to be careful of. Now, this is what always happens in history. Because, because why? We have to prove ourselves. We have to prove, hey, we're Americans. We have to prove, hey, we're Greeks. And that's what happened back then. There was a group called the Misyavnim, mis, mis which means becoming Greek. 40% of the affluent Jews adopted the Greek, Greek culture to such an extreme that they did cosmetic surgery and they uh, to put back the piece of foreskin. Yeah. To put back the piece of foreskin. Why? Because everything was open. Everything was nude. That was the in thing back in Greek. The body was beautiful. 
So that no one, people when they went outside in the street without clothes. They went to the bathhouses without clothes. They went to the sporting events without clothes, right? So they were embarrassed and didn't want to be different than the non-Jews. The non-Jews had that foreskin. So they had it put back. They had it put back. Now, the Greeks would have won this battle against the Jews by default. If the Greeks wouldn't have done anything and the Jews would have continued, they would have, they would have disintegrated and disintegrated and degraded themselves to a point where there would have been no Jews left. To that extent. But what happened? They didn't want to kill the Jews. They wanted to destroy their morale. And they were doing a great job. But what happened? There was, first of all, there was no Shabbat, no kosher, the pig was a delicacy, and the Jews were not religious anymore. They, didn't hold, they, they wanted to be like the Goyim. But what happened? So the Greeks, like I said before, would have won the battle by default. What happened? They overstepped themselves, the Greeks. They shot themselves in the foot. <clears throat> they, became, they became strict on the Jews. They banned Shabbat. The kala, the, the, the bride on the wedding night, had to, leave, had to live with a Greek officer first before she went to her husband. Right? That was the provisions they had. They banned circumcision. They all, they, 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 the Jews had to uh, give, give korbanot, give sacrifices to the altar, to the Greek gods. Right? So the Jews were being forced. The Greeks started to force them to do things. Why did they do that? They didn't need to do that. The Jews were stubborn. If you force a non-religious Jew not to be religious, right, even more, you take that opportunity away from him, you take that freedom of choice away from the, from the non-religious Jew, you know what he's going to say? You know, I'll show you how Jewish I can be. That's what happened. What happened? Why did the Greeks, what are they, brainless? Didn't they see that the Jews were going down and down as it is? How come all of a sudden they changed their tune? Why did they get strict all of a sudden? What happened? What, what triggered something in their minds? What happened? Why did the Greeks force the issue? Why did they become violent? Why did they shoot themselves in the foot? Right? That's a very good question. The, uh, it seems like the, it, it was an attractiveness to lure the Jews away from Judaism. That's such an attractive thing. You know, they always say, always get a Jewish husband. The, non, the, non, the, gen, the, the non-Jewish woman would always say that. Oh, Jews, Jewish husbands are the best. They always try to lure them, the Jews, into, into the non-Jewish world. Uh, I remember I, I, there was a girl that I used to go out with who used to work for a very top, top film, uh, f- firm, counting firm. One of the top, tops in the country. And she was a beautiful girl. And she had a co-worker that was non-Jewish and it was hitting on her every day. Every day he was trying to, uh, to, to find a way to, uh, to go out with her, to do something, to seduce her, you know, why? Because she was Jewish. She wanted to, to, he wanted to break her down. He wanted to break her down. Uh, I don't know if you read my email about Timna. Now, let's, let's talk about Timna. Timna was the mother or grandmother, and some say it was both, of Amalek. Amalek the, uh, was the grandson of es- Esav. Timna uh, was the daughter of a queen, daughter of a king, and she had a famous family, her brother was very famous, prominent person, and she said, I'd rather be uh, a, cock- a concubine, a mistress to uh, Eliphaz, which is Esau's son, than be a queen to my country. Because of the family of Abraham. And she tried to seduce 
or, 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 or try to get married, or try to get into the family. She wanted to marry Avraham. Avraham turned her away. She tried to marry his son Yitzchak. Yitzchak turned her away. She tried to marry Yaakov. Yaakov turned her away. Turned her away. Why? Because she was not worthy to be a part of the family. What happened? What was wrong with Timna that they turned her away? Well, when the Jews, after they, they left Egypt, and they, they, the big miracle with the splitting of the sea, and the Jews were in the desert, right? And the whole world saw the beautiful miracles, the amazing miracles that God did with the Jews, right? Uh, it says, Rashi says, that nobody wanted to start up with the Jews. They were at such a holy state and everybody looked up, wow, look what God's miracle, look what God did to the Jews, look what God did, it was just an incredible miracle. But there was one country, one nation, that started up with the Jews, they, got, they went into war with them. So Rashi says that it's like a pool, a hot pool, and all the kids are around, no one's going in because it's hot. Now one kid jumps in, so everybody says, ah, if one kid jumps in, that means that the water is cool. And they all go in after that. The people swore that no one was starting up with the Jews because they were at a high, high level. All of a sudden, Amalek jumps in. Then they say, all right, they're not so spiritual. Or not, all right, it wasn't such a great miracle. That's why God himself hates, the, hates Amalek. That's why it says you should stamp your feet and wipe out Amalek. We see from here that the genealogy of Timnah didn't have much spirituality. She, they didn't have it. They were cold to spirituality. They didn't believe in God. And that's why Avraham, Misak, and Yaakov didn't want to get involved with her. Because of that. But unfortunately, because of the rejection of Timnah, her ancestors had a certain rage because of the rejection. They were jealous of Jews because of Timnah. Because Timnah was tossed away by Avraham, Isaac, and Yaakov. They were jealous. They were upset. They were enraged that, they, she, that she was pushed aside. There was a deep down subconscious feeling, you know, why she was pushed aside. That's, this was the reason there was a certain anti-Semitism in the world by Esav. Automatically. But it's, hot. it's, it's, it's a monstrous hatred towards Jews. But it, it, it's, it's mind-boggling because at one end, they want to pull the Jews in. At, a one, at, the, at one end, after they pull you in and they want you, they get into a fight with you. Why is that? Why is it that they want you, they want you, they please come in, like the Greeks, all of a sudden, they, they turn violent against them. What's the reason? Now, here's the reason. I believe, I believe this is the most important lesson between the relationship between Jews and non-Jews. Very important lesson. You have to know, you have to listen to this. That you'll hear, you'll, you'll hear. There's a statement in Tehillim by David the Melech. I believe it's Kuf Hay or Kuf uh, Vav. I'm not sure which one it was. One of those. It says, if you get close to the Goyim and you want to get friendly with them. They will turn against you. Cardinal rule, automatically. When you want to get close to the goyim, automatically it's like a boomerang. It's going to be against you. They're going to go against you. And this is like King David's words. David the Melech said this. The Mesha Chochma elaborates more. This is Rav Meir Simcha. <clears throat> he elaborates more on the concept uh, in, in detail. He said this a number of years before the Holocaust. And in some ways he predicted the Holocaust because the Germans of that era were so much into becoming the Jews, German Jews, were so much into becoming Germans that they gave up everything. They started a reform movement. They wanted to be Germans. And this is what happened. When you get, when you get close to the Goyim and you want to open your arms for them, that's when they slap you in the face. That's when they slap it's, it's It's something, it's a trigger. Why? Now, it's, just, it's not just Mayor Simcha, a, a number of, a lot of commentaries wrote about this. 
<clears throat> this is how anti-Semitism is stirred up. <clears throat> this is how it's brewed. This is how it's brewed. The closer you get to them, that's when it starts. We left Egypt, uh, idolatry and all, but truthfully, it says it specifically that we did not associate with the Egyptians. And that is the reason we were blessed to becoming a nation. This is the reason why we left Egypt. It was more, they did not associate with us. True, they didn't associate with us, which is a blessing. Which is a blessing. They thought we were repulsive to that extent. Uh, and if you want to avoid anti-Semitism and have mutual respect, <clears throat> you stick to your religion, you stick to your roots, you stick to your foods, <clears throat> and you stick to the Jewish lifestyle. Um, and, you know, don't mix. No mixing in picnics. Don't drink with them. There are Christmas parties you should not go to. You cannot associate with them, respect them 100%. You have to give them that respect. And, you'll get, and when you respect them and say, hi, listen, I'm different, they'll respect you. They'll respect you. Cordial relations is important uh, because you, us, Jews, were meant to be different. You were meant to be different. The fact that there is anti uh, the fact that there is anti Semitism uh, when it's not a religious country, right, shows you that it's illogical. That's how that's the reason that there's God. The fact that there's anti Semitism it doesn't make sense. But this is the God's promise. You get close to the Goyim, you're gonna you get, get slapped in the face. Don't get close to the Goyim. And this is a very, very important lesson that we learn about Jews and non-Jews. The important lesson is we were meant to be different. We were meant to have different dress, different way of life, because we're Jews. We were a different level. We were meant to be different. And the fact of the matter is, this is what we learn from all of history, uh, if you notice. Whenever we got close to the non-Jews in every aspect of it, that's when we used to get slapped, slapped. The Bolsheviks, they can, they can take a lesson back with the Bolsheviks. Who were the ones that were part of the Bolsheviks, that, that helped bring up the Bolsheviks? The Jews, they were part of that, uh, the Melsheviks and the Bolsheviks. They were part of both, uh, both uh, parties. But yet, they were the ones who got slapped in the face at the end. So this is the lesson we learn about anti-Semitism and Hanukkah. And we hope that we should take this lesson in our workplace, especially. Because the workplace is where it's, it's really prevalent the most. This is when we're associated with, with, uh, with non-Jews at most. We hope that's just it. You know, not in our, not in our homes and not in our uh, 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 areas where we socialize. But in our workplace, it's more prevalent than more than anything else. So you always have to have on guard always have to have the ability to eat separately in some sense of the word very all these little things make a difference and we will that be able to grow and become better Jews and better people and live in peace with our neighbors the goyim thank you